Well, good morning to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today um, in this session. Um, just before we kick off, I've got a couple of questions there on the screen. If you wouldn't mind chatting in your answers, that will help me to, to tailor today's session to make sure that I meet your needs. So if you can let me know if you've used Connect before and also what you hope to learn to do today or to do differently. Um, that would be fantastic. In the meantime, I'm just going to hand over to Afsana, who's hosting today's meeting, just to run through a few housekeeping issues. You're still on mute, Afsana. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> oh, perfect, sorry. So um, just before we begin, as Moana mentioned, I'm just going to cover a few housekeeping bits for you all. Um, just to make sure the experience or during the webinar is as seamless as possible. Um, so if you have any audio issues during the call, um, I would recommend using your phone to dial in because um, we find with the computer, obviously you're using a Wi-Fi and that can impact the connection. Um, and anyone that might be using a high bandwidth kind of platform in your home or on the same internet, that could also impact your connection as well. However, if you do miss anything because of connectivity issues or just anything in general, um, we are recording this session and we will be providing the recording after via email within a week um, to you all as well. And there will be a Q&A opportunity at the end. And finally, uh, we just have something to cover off in terms of engagement. So we can't unfortunately put your microphones on just because of the way the webinar has been set up. However, you can use the Q&A and the chat box on the right-hand side, which I can see quite a few have, or you have already started using, um, just to ask any questions, share your comments. Um, just generally any technical issues you may have as well, you can drop me a message in there as well. Um, and that's all for me, so I'll hand back over to Moena. Thank you so much. I'm just going to share my um, deck with you now. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much to those of you who've popped your answer in the chat uh, there for me uh, so I can see um, whether you've used Connect and, and what you would like to learn. The first thing that I want to do today is just say a huge thank you for making time to join the session. I know this is very close to back to school. Um, it's a very stressful time as many of us are having to change the way that we teach um, and, you know, incorporate new systems, new technologies um, and deal with students who may be suffering, you know, a fair bit of anxiety around learning online or having been absent from study for a while. So really appreciate your time. I hope that this session will be useful for you. I am going to start with some, uh, some PowerPoints and I'm just going to run through some of the effective learning design tips and tricks that we can employ. Um, I'm focusing on Connect, but I will be sharing with you tips um, that you can uh, employ using your VLE or LMS, so Blackboard, Moodle, that kind of thing to really uh, create that great learning experience for your students. So please um, chat any questions that you have along the way. Asana is uh, monitoring the chat for me because I'm not very good at multitasking. Uh, so <laughs> um, she, will, she will let me know um, if there's anything um, and I will stop at the end for Q&A. So a little bit of uh, PowerPoint stuff at the beginning, then we might go live into a Connect course, um, time permitting. And so these are really um, some basic design tips. Some of them you may know already, some may be useful for you. I certainly hope that they're useful. And they're through my experience working um, and my background in instructional design, um, but also working with instructors across the world to really implement successfully. So we've learnt a lot along the 10 years that we've had Connect um, and, and some of these tips that I'm sharing with you are absolute best practices from other instructors that I've worked with as well. So just to quickly run through what we're going to do today, you will have seen this on the invite. We want to help you to design a course that meets your learning outcome, that engages students and encourages effective learning. I want to give you tips to engage students throughout the course from day one. 
uh, because that's the most important time to try and get them online. How we can go about translating a face-to-face -face course into a blended online or flipped course. How uh, we can reinforce the key concepts when you're not with them all the time. Knowing how much content to set for effective learning is a, is a key one that I want to spend a little bit of time on. I'm going to go through a couple of active learning strategies as well in case you're looking for ways to prevent Zoom fatigue and also to increase the, that's a new term that I've learned and I'm in love with it, um, and also to increase engagement with your students. And some strategies, <coughs> extraneous cognitive load for students as well. So I will spend just a little bit of time looking at the um, the adaptive component in Connect as well, which is called our Smart Book. So uh, hopefully most of you have been introduced to that. Um, and there I just want to show you how that component itself is already working to increase uh, effective learning. Uh, we're going to look at those design basics, which are structure, support, timing, and time on task, and also the need for feedback. So before you start, these are a couple of tips that um, that uh, either come from me or from instructors that I've worked with. But um, what's really important is to try and move the parts of your course that you found less effective into the online environment. So if something works very successfully for you face to face and you're still able to do that through maybe Zoom breakout rooms or um, discussion boards or any kind of experience like that, keep those. So you want to try and move anything that was less effective um, into the online space so that you can um, see if you can tweak that and get a better outcome for your student. Communication is absolutely key, especially if you're using Connect for the first time. Giving and just in this environment in general, you would know this, Give your students a roadmap of the changes and the way that you're going to teach the course using the online technology. Ideally, if it's your first time, let them know that it's your first time using the technology. We often find that students can be a little more forgiving if they know that as well. Um, and I know one of the biggest fears is, you know, what if something goes wrong? Um, and if I don't mention it later, I do have a best practice tip around putting in a bookmark into your course, which sends students directly off to our customer service support team for technical support, because the last thing you want is hundreds of emails from students. So that's a bit of a tip for later. Starting simple, there are a world of resources available in Connect, uh, particularly in some of the uh, science disciplines. I like to say it's kind of like birthday morning. You wake up surrounded by gifts. Um, starting simple is the best advice I can give you. We do not need to include everything at this point. And the more simply we start, um, probably the more effective uh, the course is going to be for you and your students. You can always tweak later and tweak it your next time, next time round. So less is more. And one of the common things that we talk about in blended learning or going online is the sometimes um, potential to slide into creating what we would call a course and a half. And that's by sort of thinking about, oh, that looks good and that looks good. I'll put all those in for my students. And the time that you're asking them to spend can blow out, which is why I'll spend some time talking to you about how um, to effectively think about the time on the activities in your Connect course. So as I said, you can always tweak along the way, particularly if you lock later assignments by using um, later dates, setting those later. Um, you can make a few changes if you need to or add some more instructions if you find something isn't working for you. Go easy on yourself by letting them know it's your first time and also you know, just being aware that it's their first time as well. We'll do the best that we can um, to make this experience great. And obviously, we're all struggling with the same challenges. Now, some of us have had loads of experience in teaching online. Um, some of us have only had um, mixed experience. And I, you know, from my own background, I only received one or two days uh, training for teaching in higher education. 
when I was involved in academia. So I certainly didn't think that was quite enough to understand how to move my course online. Uh, a key tip is wherever you can assign points onto some of the learning resources that are available, um, that you're making available to your students. So things like the adaptive reading, it's critical for engagement that you get them in there and you give them that carrot. That is where we find it's most successful. And try to use deadlines effectively to inform your teaching. Um, so, you know, if we set some of this work to be done before class and you have a deadline on that, you will find that your students obviously are a little better engaged and you're going to be able to view those reports and see exactly where your students are struggling. At the end, I do have a section just to quickly show you what are the key reports that you could use to see if what you've designed is uh, giving you the outcomes that you need. And just a final thing, I know we've got one of our, our implementation team managers on the call. We are here to help. We've got support, um, support sites, videos, implementation guides, um, and many of us on hand to help you with this experience um, and to help guide you um, with everything from setting up your course to uh, what we need to do for troubleshooting. Um, and as I said, we do have customer support available for both your students and for yourselves. Um, so please just reach out to us, um, to either your education consultant or your implementation consultant if you um, have already been introduced to them. So we're now going to pop into the core elements behind effective course design. So I mentioned those and it's really time on task, structure, support for students, and the feedback that we're giving them. So I'm going to look at each one of those um, individually now. So the first thing that um, you want to do um, is set up your course within Connect to uh, be as consistent as possible. You want that consistency, you want it to match your course syllabus. Um, and so that's the way we design here so that students who are moving between the LMS and their Connect assignments feel that continuity there for them. Um, and I'll talk a minute in a minute about cognitive load and that this is a very important thing to do to help students. So you can see I've got a screenshot here, not a very good one, but um, where we might follow the same process uh, for each of the week study. So your pre-class study, which is the adaptive um, study in SmartBook, perhaps um, a different asset to help your students practice what they've been learning. So in this instance, it's a self-assessment. It could be um, an animation. It could be a video. It could be um, a simulation. It could be anything that you find in your course if you feel that that gives them an additional chance to practice that they need. And then you can follow that with a post-class quiz. And I find that using the same naming as well is really crucial to helping students find the whole process very easy and to guide them behaviourally with the name. So if we want them to do the reading and that practice before class, calling it pre-class study, pre-session study, whatever you would like, um, and then a post-class quiz helps them to understand when they should be practising those things. We do usually recommend that adaptive, the uh, the smart book, be used uh, prior to class or face-to-face -face time. I'm going to have to do a lot of those inverted commas today, um, because it helps students to cover the uh, lower level blooms, things like understanding and remembering. So it would allow you to do higher level things together in class. You don't have to follow that sequence. Some people use it um, in other ways, but that is the key way that we see people using that. Okay, so as I mentioned, you want to echo the syllabus. So here's an example of um, a syllabus that I've been working to. The only difference there is that I always include a session zero or a week zero, and that's where we ask students to start. And that's your key place to get them into the resources and to put some of their help documents. So in there, I would always include a video of how to use uh, usually SmartBook or the Connect platform. If you can't find one of those, please reach out to either your education consultant or your implementation consultant. They're only three or four minutes. Ideally, 
if you show it in class, then you don't even need to make them do it. Um, but a great thing to do there, you're probably thinking of that already, is uh, you know getting students to um, start getting themselves involved in the course. So within your VLE or LMS, you might be doing things like introduce yourself on the discussion board or tell us a little bit about something. And it's just getting the students in there and familiarising them with the, with the assets. So I usually put some information in there as well in the session zero about how students can use the app to study offline because there are a variety of things that can be used um, on the phone. Um, you might even want to give them some guidance on where to download the, the tablet app um, if you feel like they're going to be studying um, on a tablet. So you could really put anything in there. I always recommend, of course, that putting any other help documents in both places, your LMS and Connect, just in case there's a problem with access, although we would hope there would not be. So um, in some of your uh, Connect courses, there is also an option to add something, um, a module called preparing for an online course. Um, and if you do have that option, that's a fantastic quick thing you can get them to do, which really guides them on how to behave and what to do to be a successful online learner. So cognitive load theory is something I just want to touch on for a second. Um, there's two types, well, there's three, but we'll concentrate on two. Intrinsic cognitive load is really about the difficulty of the material or the information itself. So that's about what's in your course, which you have control over. We certainly don't have control over, um, but that might be the difficulty of the material. Extrinsic cognitive load is what I want to focus on for course design, because that's the load, the working memory, um, that is generated by how the material is presented. So you can see I've just highlighted things like make sure that your uh, folder structure in Connect and you want a folder structure mirrors your course syllabus. Try to have the same types of activities with the same naming convention in each week because this reduces the cognitive load, uh, the extraneous, uh, extrinsic, sorry, I don't even know what I'm talking about today. I need more coffee. <laughs> um, so what will happen if you kind of get overwhelmed, you might think about going to a website where there's so much information going on, you don't know where to go or what to do to start off. Um, it, it's frustrating and it leads to disengagement. So we want to put as many measures as possible within here to make sure that students feel guided and feel like they're going to be confronted with the same types of material each week, but covering different topics. So. That's how we can grab control of that element um, to really reduce frustration for students. Scaffolding is another really key concept and then I want to try to apply that back to Connect and that's providing students with a framework that guides and supports their learning. So that's really thinking about connecting students' current knowledge to their prior knowledge and that's a, a place that we can really intervene with what we're doing inside the Connect course. So being explicit with students about how new topics and tasks link to concepts that have been previously introduced or maybe that they've studied before. So the key way that I would think about doing that is by adding instructions to um, anything that you set for your students to do within Connect. Now the adaptive, you can't add instructions, it has its own, um, but everything else like a quiz, and I highly recommend coming up with a basic sentence, popping that in a Word file and then copying and pasting that and just making slight adjustments as you go to save time. Instructions are so critical within Connect. There's the ability to add them and it just gives students a little bit of extra guidance. You can tell them um, what they will be doing, why they're doing it. So um, you will be watching a short video. Um, it will help you to learn about you know, a particular topic and practice uh, what you've been learning in the reading in the questions that are associated with the video. Um, and you would want to tell them how long you think that that would take as well, which we'll get to in a second. So that's covering off the what's in it for me as an adult learner, trying to connect back to something that they've learned before 
or letting them know this is a key skill that you will need to develop for your next assessment. Anything that you might normally tell them in class. And the timing is critical because a student might be looking through their activities and trying to decide, oh, I've got 15 minutes spare, which one will I do? Um, you know, and knowing that they could complete that within 15 minutes or it's a longer activity is very useful for them. So one of the ways that we can also introduce uh, or help with the scaffolding concept is to um, ask questions of students within the course and get them to review. So like a think pair share activity, which you can do on the discussion board. So I would highly recommend you can use any of the end of chapter questions, material in your instructor resource manual to come up with things that you might uh, want to ask students to do, or you might have your own and then getting them to do those within that uh, online face-to-face -face environment is a great way of helping them to start connecting their learning. You can also model questions and answers and then ask the student to do it for themselves. And there are two ways that you can do that within Connect if you can't do it live. The first one, um, and this would be available in more quantitative courses uh, like finance, um, is to use, if they're available, something called guided examples, which will walk you through or show you how to complete something before you need to do it yourself. So that's a great way of doing that. Additionally, within all of our Connect products, there is um, a space on the bottom right that says uh, recorded lectures, I think, and you can use our inbuilt free technology or your own to make a short video to show the students how you would do something and then set that for students to watch. So it, it really doesn't matter whether you use integrity or your own software, it's just about adding in um, your voice for a start and then also um, being able to model something that maybe you're not wanting to do in a two hour lecture. Or maybe you're hoping to shorten the lecture and put more things online, so that's another key way. And thinking about the feedback that you give to students is really important as well. Um, and I think it might be coming up next. We're just going to quickly look at how you can provide feedback within Connect. So giving a lot of feedback early, as you would know, and hints, things like check my work, and that's very often available um, as a setting I can show you, um, where the students can actually check their work before they submit it. Now, you wouldn't use that on high stakes, but you could on low stakes. And then you can gradually um, reduce the amount of feedback that you're giving with increased task competence. No, we're not. Yes, we are. We're at feedback. Okay. So within Connect, um, as you set any type of um, learning resource for students, you will be given the opportunity to select between homework, practice, quiz, or exam. Um, it doesn't matter which one you pick specifically, but each of them has um, a basic set of, of, of functions that are available, but you can edit all of those using the edit all settings here. So here you would want to concentrate on the feedback. So particularly with things like a quiz, you might want to allow students to see feedback after each question, and that could be right or wrong, or it could be the full solution. And some students learn quite well in that way and it keeps them engaged. Um, it's always useful to provide them with full feedback the first time they do a quiz in terms of the immediacy of the feedback for their own learning experience. You can also delay that feedback. It depends on, on what you want to do and how you're using it. Um, and I also would recommend, if you can, setting quizzes uh, with unlimited attempts so that students can practice that again and again to, to build up their, their, um, their learning and their understanding. So you can change anything here in terms of um, scrambling the questions, but I did want to draw your attention to that feedback, number of different options there, um, and just thinking about how that will help a student who you've got less contact with. So as I mentioned, look, delaying the feedback, as you would know, can disrupt the learning process, Sometimes we have to do that. So in those sort of earlier weeks or any time that you might introduce a quiz, it's a great idea to try and provide that feedback as quickly as possible. 
And as I mentioned, check my work and sometimes hints are off, often available as well. So do check for those. They'll be in this setting here and you can find out um, if they're available, you can allow them. Okay, so when we're thinking about support, support comes in a number of different forms. The first one I've mentioned is session zero. That's the first place that students start to get support in using the, um, in using the resources and also some tips on where they might go to get help. Um, as I mentioned, help documents, instructions, guidance in Connect and also in the LMS. As I've mentioned, always provide instructions and allowing that feedback. Now, the one thing that I wanted to add in there around feedback is that if they are using the smart book or the adaptive, that provides continuous feedback and a personalized learning path for the students. So you can be uh, sure that that is an excellent low stakes opportunity for students to be getting continuous feedback and being able to drill into their own strengths and weaknesses in the subject area. So even if you do want to delay feedback on the quiz and you're setting the adaptive, they are already getting that continuous feedback uh, throughout adaptive. And reinforcing your key concepts is another thing that I would suggest in here through Tegrity or your video capture functionality. Uh, one of the things that I've seen instructors do very successfully at the moment is to make a one minute video, two minute video, pop that in after each week to cover off the top three things you want them to remember or to provide instructions or anything you like. And that really personalizes the course for your students as well and puts your voice throughout the whole thing. And it can help them to really focus in on, on what you're saying, particularly as we find sometimes students do not come to our classes. So we're moving on now to time on task. Um, and this is an important thing because I mentioned uh, it can be easy to accidentally make a course and a half. And to be fair, Many of the resources inside Connect don't have a time um, calculation on them. So I wanted to help you to do that. Um, we always want to provide students with an approximate time in the instructions that we write. Approximate is good. You get less um, held to that one. So a good time range is helpful for students. Um, I don't find it's great if you put that it's you know extremely long, <laughs> if it isn't. Um, and this is one of the things that's quite different. I think in an ordinary course outline, we don't normally tell students how long each activity would take. Um, and this is kind of one of the key elements about being online. So as a general guide, we might say a multiple choice takes between one and two minutes to complete, depending on how difficult it is. Within Connect, um, and please, if I don't show this afterwards, can, uh, just contact your McGraw-Hill representative to learn more about this one. Um, you can easily filter your multiple choice questions or any of your questions to see, uh, sometimes they have a level of difficulty. And if not, they will almost always have Bloom's levels. So if you select your lower level Bloom's levels or easy medium uh, difficulty with the multiple choice, they're more likely to take that shorter amount of time. Worksheet questions, which you'll find in um, finance, accounting, um, a few of the business type subjects, will take a little longer because there are multiple parts of the question. So they are usually between five and 10 minutes. And similarly with video questions, if there's a video and a few questions, have a quick look at how long the video runs for. They're normally quite short, usually three to four minutes. If they've got a couple of multiple choice, you might say the whole thing is seven to eight minutes. But a very simple guide for you is however long it takes you to answer something, you multiply that by three and that's how long it may take a student to complete. With adaptive study, so our smart book, you do also have the opportunity of using this slider bar on the right hand side when you assign this content. Um, what is really important, and I wanted to just call this out in case you don't know, is that time on the bar does not calculate the reading time of a student. We wouldn't typically try and calculate how long it takes a student to read something. You know, we've got general guidelines around six to seven minutes per page. 
uh, you know, rough number of pages per chapter minus diagrams. It doesn't matter. Students read at their own pace, and that might be um, a lot quicker or a lot slower than we think. So this slider bar is only based around how long they should spend answering the questions that will appear. So I tend to keep that on the lower level. That does not mean even if um, when you first come in, it says two hours and 54 minutes of questions. That does not mean it's a more complicated chapter or that you should set two hours and 54 minutes. I think most students would um, be a little shocked if they saw that flashing up for them to do. You can keep that a lot lower because it allows the students to engage in, in the, um, the adaptive questioning and leave before they're getting too frustrated. And all that happens is we just ask less questions about each of the key learning objectives. So if you were to assign it for the full length of time, you might get 100 questions per learning outcome. So my advice is set it a little lower um, because you've got to keep in mind that they do also have to do the reading as well. So with those instructions, we've mentioned those already. Um, just again, and um, I've probably put this down twice, we'll share these slides as well, but knowing what the activity is, how will it help me as a student, how long is it going to take, and anything else that is really key. In some of the quantitative subjects, we have algorithmic questions, which change variable each time. I'm surprised to tell you that I have dealt with several cohorts of students who felt that that was something wrong with the system. So I now include in my instructions, um, the following questions will change variables each time you attempt the question. This is to help you to um, learn how to effectively complete the activity. Um, that's, I never thought that I would say that you have to do that, and maybe that was just a few cohorts. Um, but little pieces of information like how many attempts do you have on this quiz? Is it limited um, to only one attempt? Do you have a time limit? And also, will you receive feedback after each question at the end of the quiz? Those are very useful uh, things for students and stop them asking some of the questions. So I'm going to just spend a couple minutes now on SmartBook, just looking at how that creates effective learning. And I think we're going to uh, go straight into a couple of key reports that you can use. And then we're going to go live into Connect with some time for questions. So SmartBook, and I've just put that up on the screen for you, is that combination of highlighted reading and questions. And those questions really are designed to appear at the time when students have been reading for the right amount of time that they need to start practicing what they've just learned so that they don't forget it. When students come in, they can either decide that they want to answer questions or read. A top tip for you, statistically, um, our research shows that students who start with questions and not the reading take far longer to complete the activity than those who read first, as you would imagine. Either way, they will get pushed backwards and forwards between the reading and the questions because it is actually built on Quite a few uh, seminal theories from learning science. I'm not going to go into all of them now. It's basically built on the idea of memory decay. So at a certain time, you are going to start to forget what you've learned. So the system tries to intervene there and refresh that knowledge with you again so that you're less likely to forget it. It asks you to keep practicing things in the form of deliberate practice, which is shown to be far more effective. Then it does things like put together information in certain ways, so um, spaced practice, so that again, that supports long-term um, memory. And the metacognitive theory, which is inbuilt in there too, helps students to understand um, how much of the information they know and what they don't know. And that allows them to spend their time more effectively on study. If they are able to see, these are the areas. Not only that, the system specifically asks questions that will guide students um, to keep studying the things that they need to study the most, which is you know, not going to be the same as the student next to them. Okay, so hopefully that made sense, my um, whip through. 
oh, I do have active learning strategies first. So active learning, as we know, is um, involving students in doing things and thinking about what they're doing. And so this is a useful framework to consider how students encounter new information, engage with the information and ideas, and then reflect on their learning. So I've got a bit of a continuum there, um, which goes all the way through into you know, the most active learning and more passive learning. We don't want to um, make this incredibly difficult. I just want to show you a couple of tips to engage your students uh, with some more active learning um, capabilities with, within Connect and also your VLE. So if you're in biology, for example, we have specific types of questions called Socratic questions, which help students to think critically and uh, engage in active learning. Generally speaking, we can do things like group work, so think, pair and share. So we can do that um, in a Zoom breakout. We could do that on a discussion board and have them present their findings. Grab information that you need from the textbook, from the resources, from the instructor resource manual to uh, create uh, resources that you can then repurpose for uh, active learning. So obviously we have the case studies and scenarios that you could also get people to go away and have a small group discussion about and present their findings. Using a discussion forum, um, a one minute paper where they have to go away and talk about what they've learned and then post that perhaps um, you know, with a, um, in a blog. Uh, and we also have things that are sort of more active learning for students on their own perhaps, which are things like the simulations also known as ABAs, which are in most of our Connect products. And there's lots of different ways of introducing those. Polling is obviously just the greatest. So one tip I love to give people is just to go and get a multiple choice question from the question bank, pop that into your PowerPoints, um, and then poll the answer in class. And you can keep doing that throughout the lecture. Um, even the simulations, you could go through one of our simulations and get them to poll what they would do next. Even though it is meant to be a singular um, thing to do, there's no reason that we can't involve everybody by using uh, polling. And there's lots of free tools out there and your university may also have um, a polling tool that you can use. Of course, you can also set up polls within Zoom. Um, so that's another tip. So. Um, Overall, um, if you're wanting to replace lectures, you can do that with video and then uh, a lot of people are looking at cutting down that lecture and then putting different learning resources to make up the time and do that in a different way. Um, use the tools we have, use your tools. Reinforcing lectures can be done with the adaptive, so with Smartbook. Replacing in-class activities can be done with end of chapter questions or assignments in Connect and discipline specific resources that I've mentioned already. Assessing can be done through online quizzes and tests. We have test banks that you can use. You can either import those into your VLE, or we do also offer um, some form of lockdown for you, but you may already have that at your university. And things that you can do for high stakes assessment, obviously pooling questions, scrambling, algorithmic questions, putting on time limits and passwords. Um, I think I've covered most of these tips. A few more things that I wanted to let you know. Within um, your Connect course is the Library tab. In the Library tab, you can click on that and go to Instructor Resources, and there's often a wealth of things for you to use. The Instructor Resource Manual, I know we're releasing new ones right now that cover COVID activities. Um, we very often will tell you how to use digital resources, how to uh, teach online, we might give you additional videos that you could be using, um, brand new cases. Some of our products have author blogs where they're posting new things all the time. So if you get stuck and you need more information, that is a great place to go. Obviously PowerPoint's in there as well. Um, and I do always recommend to run a practice session for high stakes assessment to reduce student anxiety. So you might wanna have an exam drill or some exam prep in the lead up to a final exam to test out how students are going online and if they can make, make a deadline. Okay, got about two more minutes in here and then I'm gonna go into Connect and also start answering some questions. So within 
the uh, depending on which smart book you're using. So if you're not familiar with this, again, just reach out to us. One of the things is you've spent all this time designing your course. Um, you've tried your best to put in effective and engaging things and to make the structure very seamless and to make sure that the time, uh, you know, isn't more than you would normally ask a student to spend. But one of the key things that we can do is to find out whether they're engaging and then make sure that we keep them engaged or get them engaged through what we find in reports. So this is a dashboard example here of what we might find from, from the adaptive learning. So I can look at how many of the learners have completed. A great way to check how long it has taken them to complete the questions. So here we set a range of 31 to 47 minutes and they finished in 33 minutes. Um, this is really about how overconfident or underconfident your students are. And then what concepts they found challenging. That was um, not, not a good one, uh, 24 out of 26. Um, and then you can look up individual learners. So what's key here is using these reports to see how much they're reading, to also see, um, which you can drill into, how much time they spent answering questions versus the reading and what learning outcomes they're struggling with. We can also use the at-risk report to see online engagement and the assignment reports to see which other questions they're sort of consistently getting incorrect on the quizzes or having trouble with. And I'll show you those reports now and then I'll show you what we need to do with those to make sure that we sort of close the gap on students. Uh, that's just another snapshot of what you'll be able to see and you can drill in there to, you know, uh, to see individual students. This is the at-risk report that would give you an indicator on their online engagement scores. So that is a combination of how often they log in, how much time they're spending, their scores um, and the number of attempts that they're making. You can also go into an item analysis, which will tell you which learning sections they might be struggling with or topics. But the key thing is to let students know that you're looking at this information. So if you regularly refer to the missed questions or the difficult learning outcomes in class, they will know that there is a connection between what they're doing online and what you're teaching in class. So I've worked with some instructors who very successfully would set the, um, set the, the adaptive study or smart book to be done by nine o'clock on a Monday morning. And of course you can allow for lateness. I think they were giving 1.5 marks per, per week, you know, with maximum of 12 marks. But what they did was they used these reports and popped up on screen, this is the question that most of you missed. And so I wanna take you through how to solve that question. Um, you know, this is the area that you are struggling in most. So today I'm going to spend more time on that area and skip through some of the ones that you were doing very well in. So that's one way of sort of not only adapting your lecture, but also letting them know that you're looking because the more you look and the more they know about it, the more likely they are to be engaging in it. That is a good question. I'll come back to that one. Um, okay. If you can, obviously you would insist um, on students doing it before class, that's totally up to you. Um, on the right is a screenshot for what the students will see themselves. So encouraging students to actually view their own reports is another way of getting them to drill in. Even if they don't do that, if you let them know that you know how they're going overall, I mean, it's not invasive, it's just giving you a general theme of how your students are going it will help you to uh, make sure that they maintain focus with those resources. Letting students know that you're gonna choose some of the exam questions from either the weekly quizzes or from SmartBook um, is another great way of getting them in there, even if you don't put points on it. Um, so you can grab a couple of those questions and put them into your exam. Uh, we can help you with that. Okay. Um, Another great idea is to include exam drills or prep in the preceding weeks in which you let them know there might be a couple of questions in the exam. Again, that drives students back in to do some additional practice. Okay, so 
I'm now going to um, just go into Connect for a moment and we'll also. Um, now, um, Afsana, can you see my screen? I can't see you. Can you just yell out for me? Hoping you can see my screen. Yep, I can see it. Sorry, I have my my thing <laughs> muted on my phone. <laughs> no, that's all right. Okay, I'm going to jump in here really quickly um, and do a couple things, and then oh, thank you very much. And then um, I'm going to open it up for questions, and I can dive into any of these more um, more fully. Um, so this is a course that um, I mentioned that I've been working on. So um, this is the instructor side always a good idea to see what that looks like on the student side, then you get logged out and you have to find it again. Um, just to test whether that's appearing, you know, as in the most uncluttered way possible. Um, and I can tell you this, when I started out designing, I used to think more is more, and um, I certainly did not use to create um, courses that I think students found easy to navigate. So it's a learning experience and I'm trying to share with you um, you know, uh, what we've all learned along the way, which is no matter how many exciting resources there are, always a good idea to um, start off simple and then make your way through um, each time you, you sort of deliver the course. So this would be your student view here. Um, this is an example of a very simple week. Ideally, you would have that pre-session study, which is your adaptive, followed by a quiz. Um, in this particular group that I was working with, um, did, we're doing a lot of other activities face-to-face. Um, -face. So we've kept this very simple. You could put in more opportunities for practice. Additionally, you might want to use some of the resources in here to use in class. We have many videos and things that you could use um, to show rather than setting it as homework for students. Um, I wanted to draw your attention to that which I mentioned. In the bookmarks tab here, I've got self-service support, including how-tos for students and direct access to customer support. Um, this is where they go to download the mobile app or to learn more about that so they can do their study offline. So you can put a lot of tools in there. Um, that is an excellent question. Um, coming back to those questions in a moment. <coughs> so um, at the moment, I appear to only have one thing under this session zero, but normally I would add a couple of things, <coughs> excuse me, such as how to access the, the app, <coughs> um, even if they could find the instructions down below, always a good idea to give them more. Um, and if possible, as I mentioned, make it mandatory or show this video in class that tells you how SmartBook works because students are often confronted. It's not the same as a, like a, a linear reading experience. This is quite different. And if they, <laughs> if they understand why and how the system works, they're more likely to get um, to sort of be less frustrated with it, I guess. So one of the um, frustrations that I hear from students is, oh, it's asking me the same question, it must be broken. Um, and it's asking me questions I've already seen. So there's a couple of key reasons behind that. And it's asking questions that you've already seen because it might be time for you to recharge what you've learned already. And sometimes it's picking up that you're very frustrated. Um, and so it will go and look for questions it knows you know the answer to, to help bring back your confidence. So there's quite a few different reasons there um, with that one. Now I've looked at the time. I have not got time to keep going over this one. So, Afsana, would you like to um, just let me know of um, the questions, if you could, and um, and then I can go through anything else. Sure. Um, so, we have, how much detail can you get on item students are having problems with? Is it based on chapters, concepts, or even more detailed items? Yes, great question. So, the, the reporting that we have, can uh, generally goes at the, um, so it, it's at an assignment level. So it might be giving you information based on a particular chapter. So it will give you um, performance according to the section of the chapter, if you want to include that. Performance according to the learning objective. 
um, if it's a quiz, it's going to show you the questions, the exact questions and how they performed. Um, if you've had more than one attempt, you can see every attempt that they've made. You could go a little further. You can also drill down and use different filters like the Bloom's levels. So you could see how they were performing to those. And then within many products, we do have different um, industry standards that you could measure things against as well, sort of um, like ABET for engineering. Um, so you can go right down in that item analysis and there's a few different things um, that you can see there. Within the adaptive, you can drill down to the exact learning outcomes that they're struggling with, the questions that they miss the most often or um, the most challenging of those um, concepts. So quite a lot of um, ability to drill down and, and really hone in on where are they struggling, what should I you know, mention in the next face-to-face. Um, brilliant, we've got another one. How about regular reading? Does it make sense to add that alongside smart book readings or is it redundant? Great question. Um, it is redundant, um, probably, to have both um, because it is the same material. It's just presented in a different way. Um, it depends on how you want to teach the course. What I like to let students know is that if they just come across here, they can click on the ebook and they can read that linear ebook if they want to do that. It's there, also available on their phone, it's downloadable and it's offline on your phone. So I like to let them know because sometimes people just don't like the concept. More often, they don't like the concept if we explain it in week one um, and then they forget. I find it's good to revisit, so call in your consultant to help you. Um, revisit that in about week three. You know, why? Why are we using this? What does it do for me? And I think um, if they can get across that core concept that this is truly personalised, it's only for them, and it's only going to show them um, the content that they need to be looking at, well, that's what they think. They do get encouraged to read more, I can assure you. But that it's going to help them to remember and commit this stuff to memory, they probably get into it a little more. So it's there. It's probably not worth assigning both, I would say. Um, but do let them know if they need that experience of you know, highlighting and making notes and, and things like that. They're more than welcome, um, I believe. I don't want to say that, but almost all of our products offer you both options. Okay, next. Um, do we have any more questions coming through? I can't see any on my end. Okay, all right. Give well, us, oh, hang on, I think we might have another one. Um, so someone's asking, how can I create a collaborative area for project completion in an online vocational study session? Good question. Um, so it's, I'm trying to think if it would be useful if I knew the subject area. Um, Depending on it, many of our subject areas do provide things that would help for that. Um, but in many cases, it's where I would connect connect with your LMS and use the functionalities um, between Zoom in this instance and your LMS. So things like the discussion board, getting people to post stuff up and peer review, um, setting up Zoom breakouts so that they can do that work themselves or setting them a task that they have to come back um, having, you know, reviewed each other or collaborate on something. Um, the Zoom breakout rooms can allow you to do presentations as well. Um, they can screen share. Of course, it depends on the size of your class um, and whether or not that's possible. Um, there is the capacity within Connect with that lecture capture that I told you about. They can actually upload their own videos if you want to, but you may want to host that sort of within the LMS. So I always think about these being very complementary tools. Um, you know, Connect has the curated resources and, you know, we've spent money and time on product development. We've got reports that take you a little further, but your key um, functionality for some things is very much in the LMS and together they work well. So grabbing anything you can think of out of here to create um, an in-class or post-class activity is also a good idea. I hope that's answered your question, Afsana. Do we have a subject area in case I can help? Um, no, we don't. Okay. I think it was just a generic um, one. 
Um, yeah. I can't see any more questions coming in. Wow, I've finished on time, almost. <laughs> <laughs> I do hope that that was helpful for you. Um, and, uh, you know, if you have any questions, we're absolutely here to support you. We know it's a tricky time. Um, please just reach out and ask questions. We uh, greatly, greatly appreciate your time today. And um, yes, it's been great to have your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. That was really great. Um, as mentioned, so we will be obviously sending an email out to you after with the recording of this session, along with a certificate within a week um, of today. Um, thank you for your time. Do stay connected. Connect with us on our social channels on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. And of course, if you have any questions, um, you're more than welcome to drop us an email as well and get in touch directly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day.